You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni, bringing to you this show, If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. To know Mary is to know Jesus, and to know Jesus is to know Mary. They are inseparable. And our Lord, in his gracious will and his infinite wisdom, God the Father has given, has deemed to give us an immaculate mother, the, an immaculate mother of our Savior. And today is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, one of my favoritest Marian feast days. It is a big one. It's a dogma. That means that Mary has been conceived in the womb of her mother, Saint Anne, immaculate, free from the stain of original sin, free, and she possesses the fullness of original innocence, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight, so I'm really looking forward to it, and I beg your prayers as well that I could do it justice, that I could honor Our Lady as God honor her, uh, honors her, and that's my intent, and hopefully I can deliver that so to bring more understanding of what it means, the Immaculate Conception. So how I'm going to approach this is uh, I have a reading from the Marian Movement of Priests. It's message number 309 where she talks about how Jesus, her son, is even coming to her defense for all the blasphemies that are hurled against her immaculate conception or her perpetual virginity or whatever it may be. So, So our Lord is going to come to her defense, and I believe that. I believe it. He came to her defense many times uh, throughout the history of the church through the fathers of the church, like St. Augustine, like uh, saints like St. Saint Bonaventure, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Pio. They speak volumes of what we call hyperdulia. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, what the meaning of hyperdulia is. And, um, and even, in fact, God even honors Mary hyperdulia in Scripture. So we'll talk all about that, and I do have a presentation to tie all of this in in just a minute. But before we get into that, let's begin with our prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse, dear Immaculate Mother, how we love you so. We can't thank God the Father enough for giving us so good a mother, so good a mother that bore his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, became incarnate in your womb. The immaculate conception was necessary for the incarnation of Christ to take place. Otherwise, it would never have taken place. So we can't thank you enough, Eternal Father, for giving us Mary and giving us Jesus through Mary, who is the true Savior of the world. So as we honor Mary, may we give her the highest honor that any creature can can, it, can obtain shy of worshiping. We don't worship Mary, but we do honor her hyperdulia. We worship God alone, and that is clear. And that's our intent tonight, and we pray this in the holy and powerful name of Jesus, through your immaculate heart, in union with St. Joseph. St. Joseph, be with us in a powerful way as terror of demons, and help us to honor your beloved spouse, Mary. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So thank you for joining me. <clears throat> and um, where I'd like to start is from the Mary Movement of Priests to set the stage for tonight's show. And uh, again, it is uh, message number 309 taken from the Mary Movement of Priests. It's uh, Our Lady's message is given to Father Gobi, to the priests, her beloved sons. And it's, it's in Italy. It was given in Italy May 2nd, 1985. So it, um, I believe it talks about, well, that's probably when uh, St. John Paul II was uh, reigning pope. And uh, it's titled, Your Reparation. And this is what she says, quote, Walk along the road which I have traced out for you without allowing yourselves to be seized by lack of confidence or discouragement. This is the most dangerous snare with which my adversary seeks today to check the force of my victorious cohort. And in this way, he tries to bring misunderstanding and division into your midst. 
He makes you feel the burden of the difficulties which weigh upon the exercise of your priestly ministry. He emphasizes the sense of misunderstanding and rejection with which you are sometimes surrounded. Do not stop before these snares which Satan places in your way because he feels fear of my cohort which I have formed for myself in every part of the world with the little ones who have accepted my invitation to consecrate themselves to my immaculate heart. Respond with the greatest confidence and with filial abandonment to me. Offer me with simplicity of little children. Everything that happens to you, joys and sorrows, interior trials and physical sufferings, the numerous wounds of your soul and everything which in whatever manner becomes a source of suffering for you. So Our Lady is not, I'm going to pause here for a minute, Our Lady is not a stranger to the cross. Jesus says, if you wish to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That includes participating in Christ's suffering. And St. Paul says, if we participate in his suffering and death, we shall also participate in rising with him in glory. Answer, now, getting back to Mary, moving the priest, quote, Our Lady, answer with that prayer which must become intensified and continual. Then you will have the strength from Jesus to resist all the subtle seductions of the evil one. You will receive from the Holy Spirit the light of the wisdom which enlightens you and leads you to see every dangerous snare which is set along your path. From the Father there is given to you the joy of a tender, and filial abandonment to his divine action, which predisposes with love for each one of you every circumstance in your life. In this month of May, consecrated to me, intensify as well your filial reparation for the sacrilegious and diabolical way in which the life of your Heavenly Mother is being publicly presented. All heaven trembles with indignation before the public and grave outrage tender to the, to the honor of your heavenly mother. And Jesus is now personally taking up the defense of the creature who is most loved and glorified by him. Okay, so those are words. I'm going to stop there. It's a plea from Our Lady. And I believe Jesus is going to come to her defense because... It's, it's just like any son with her mother. I, I mean, Jesus has a mother, and they, he lived with her right up to the time of his death. Well, actually, he lived with her right up to the time of his public ministry, but he lived with her for at least 30 years, and believe you me, they, I'm sure mother and child, they were best of friends, and they knew each other intimately. Having said that, he had so much love for his mother, and he has so much love for his mother, that I think it would be a lot easier if we took punches at him than his mother. And I can understand that. I think it would be a lot easier if you insulted me and spit at me and took punches at me than if we did if that happened to my mother. I don't think I can handle it as a, as a man. And I don't think Jesus could either. Well, I'm sure he can handle it, but I'm sure... He's greatly offended by it, and he will come to his defense, just like any good son would do for his mother. So I believe that. Nevertheless, it's just my opinion. It's not a dogma or etched in stone. It's my opinion. I would do the same. So the, he comes to the defense of the creature who is most loved and glorified by him. Now, where does it say that in the Bible? You know, we have a lot of um, our non-Catholic uh, brothers and sisters saying, well, where does it say in the Bible that I even pray to Mary? Where does it say that uh, Mary glorifies God the most? Well, you're not going to find an explicit direct reference to that that says, oh, you need to pray to Mary. Oh, you need to honor her. Not going to be there. You're not going to find it. And there's a reason for that, and I'll get into that in a minute. Where does it say to pray to Mary in the Bible? It doesn't say it. But I will say, where does it not say to pray to Mary in the Bible? Where is that? It's not there either. But we can discover that it is God's will and pleasing to him that we pray to Mary, and it is implicitly 
reference in the Bible. Not explicitly, implicitly. You can draw out of there, and I'll show you how we can do that. So, much of the... And so this is a biblical defense of, how, of praying to Mary and honoring Mary and a biblical defense of her immaculate conception, and that's my, my attempt in tonight's show. All right, so having said that, I, I would say that the opposition to what I'm saying, those that believe will, will say that where is, it, where is it in the Bible to pray to Mary or why to pray to Mary, and here's a good one that a lot of the um, our non-Catholic Christians uh, use as well. I go directly to God. You know, why do I have to go through a creature? You know, I can understand that logic. I, I really can, and I sympathize with that, and that's a good one. It, it's actually good. You can go directly to God. However, you're going to discover that not even Mary went to directly to God. And many of the saints didn't go directly to God. All right? But I can understand that logic because you don't want to engage in idolatry. And much of that logic comes from scriptures like Exodus 20. You shall not have false gods before me. You shall not have any graven images. You know what? And I agree with them 100% because all worship belongs to God alone. But this is where the notion of hyperdulia comes in, which I'll get into in a minute, which means veneration that is proper to Mary. It is the highest veneration given to a creature other than God. It's not worship, but it's veneration. And God himself even venerates Mary, hyperdulia, and it's in Scripture. And I'll show you where. Another one is, it's not the will of God to pray to Mary. Oh, it's idolatry. And from a Catholic standpoint, they'll say that somehow excessive praying to Mary and excessive devotion to her is spiritually unhealthy. And it robs God of the glory that's due to him. Or somehow it casts a shadow on the glory and honor to do to God alone. But that's, nothing's further from the truth, because it says here, the one who Christ, the creature who Christ loved, most loved and glorified him most. How can we say that the creature that glorifies him most robs him of glory? It's a contradiction, and it's illogical. It's unreasonable. So it doesn't make sense. You know, and if we give God more glory and honor than the creature who Scripture talks about giving God glory and honor to God the most, then perhaps we should bow ourselves before his infinite majesty and let him exalt us above Mary. If I am more humble than Mary, then God should exalt me way above her. And the same goes for others. If we believe that we're more humble and we give God more glory by going directly to God, then he should exalt us above Mary. That's all. So you're not going to find a direct reference in the Scripture to pray to Mary, but an implicit one. And I also support this claim by church fathers like St. Augustine, um, uh, saintly popes like Pope Pius X and Leo XIII, saints like St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Augustine, St. Bonaventure. These are fathers of the church that were way before Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. These were fathers of the church that proclaimed these truths about the great mother of God from the get-go. So again, praying to Mary simply means devotion to Mary, and devotion to Mary does not imply worshiping Mary. I just want to make that distinction. Devotion doesn't imply worship. It means conversation, or she's interceding for us before the great king on our behalf. Okay? Now, Mary, we know that all worship belongs to God alone. Our Catholic, non-Catholic, Protestant brothers and sisters know that. I know that. And it's true. All worship belongs to God alone. Now, we admit it. I admit it. All the Catholics admit it. And Mary will admit it herself. She'll be the first one to admit it. 
And it's right there in Scripture, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 46 through 47, you can find it. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. All right, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. If Mary were God, well, why would she need a Savior then? So she's admitting it clear as day. Clear as day. That's pretty, that's pretty explicit. Okay. Now, the idea of hyperdulia, let's get back to that for a minute. There is Greek translations of the, he, the original Hebrew text, the Hebrew word that says veneration that is given to another. All right, there's an actual Hebrew word for veneration given to others, other than God. All right? And those Greek translations fall under the terms latria, which is veneration given, including worship proper to God alone. So that's latria. All right, so these are Greek translations from the original Hebrew. And then there's a word dulia, which is veneration given and proper to creatures like saints and angels. Okay? And then there's hyperdulia, the highest veneration given to Mary, just shy of God. Okay? So now that we establish that, where do we find hyperdulia in the gospel, in the gospels or in scripture? All right, so allow me to direct your attention to the Annunciation. The angel gave you appearing to Mary. Behold, you will bear a son. All right, so we'll get to that scripture in just a minute. You can find the Immaculate Conception implied there. It's not an explicit direct reference. It's implied. And we'll get to that in a minute. Of course, Mary is the mother of God, the great mother of the great king, the savior of the world, the mother of God. Jesus Christ is the second person in the divine trinity. He is both God and man. And Mary gave birth to the God-man. So the term for that is Theotokos, the God-bearer. And also in the visitation, after the instructions of the archangel Gabriel, after Mary conceived, she immediately went and ran in haste to help her cousin Elizabeth with her son John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb. And we'll get to that as well. But we can become great saints. And St. Maximilian Kolbe, a great saint, prayed this way. Not only to become a saint, but a great saint. And he said, this can only be done through the consecration and devotion to Mary, the one creature who is most loved and glorified by God. Similar saints like St. Saint Leo XIII, and Pius X, all have stated, only through Mary to Jesus can we attain the highest degree of glory possible. Those are pretty strong words from very saintly people. Now, we're going to talk about the humility of Mary because I believe this is where many who can't find a direct reference who will say, well, where is it in Scripture? It's the reason why you're not going to find a direct reference. It's because of Mary's profound humility that you will not find a direct reference to praying to Mary or honoring Mary because it was at her request to her son, according to St. Louis de Montfort, she requested from her son Jesus to keep her hidden from Scripture in that regard because she wanted all the glory to go to her son, and fittingly so because she's not God, she's a creature. And she believes, just like you and I, that all glory and honor belong to her son alone. And she will have none of it, because if it's, it's of her humility. And here's a statement from St. Louis de Montfort that backs up that claim. Mary was singularly hidden during her life. It is on this account that the Holy Ghost and the church call her alma mater, Mother secret and hidden, Alma Mater, Mother secret and hidden. Her humility was so profound that she had no inclination on earth more powerful or more constant 
than that of hiding herself from herself as well as from every other creature. So as known to God only, he heard her prayers when she begged to be hidden, to be humbled, and to be treated in all respects poor and of no account. Those are words from St. Louis de Montfort talking about her great humility and her request to be hidden, and he claims that Jesus honored that request. Not only that, according to St. Louis de Montfort, not only did God keep her hidden from Scripture, but she was hidden even from her own parents to a certain degree, and even from the angels. And he uses an Old Testament reference where the angels... I think it, uh, I don't know if it's a Song of Solomon or Book of Wisdom, but nevertheless, the angels ask, who is that? Meaning in reference to the woman that's going to give birth to the, to the Savior of the world. Who is that? But he also says that even though he hid these things, what was made known to them is nothing in comparison to what he hid from them. I mean, they did know something but not as much as what God hid from them, and that's the point that St. Louis wants to make. So it's truly uh, the reason why you're not going to find a direct reference at the request of Mary, the mother of God, Jesus, honor that request. But it's only to the humble that the Holy Spirit imparts the true knowledge of Mary now. Only to those who are humble that the Holy Spirit will impart the true knowledge. So those are words of St. Louis de Montfort as well. And he says, quote, the world knows them not, meaning the truth about Mary, because it is both incapable and unworthy of such knowledge. Oh, what grand and hidden things the mighty God has wrought in this admirable creature, as she herself had to acknowledge in spite of her profound humility. He that is mighty hath done great things to me. Happy indeed, sublimely happy are those whom the Holy Spirit imparts the true knowledge of Mary. All right. Now we talked about Mary's humility and the reason why it's not explicit in Scripture to pray to her or to honor her. It's a good, I think it would be good if we can establish the communion of the saints. I know a lot of our uh, non-Catholic brothers and sisters, they don't, uh, go along with that Catholic teaching of communing with the saints, but it means that just that we are communing with them, communicating with them, you know. And as the whole mystical body of Christ, that includes Christ as the head, and we're all the members, and we all with Christ at the head. All of us are parts of His body, according to Saint Paul. But that includes the Church triumphant, those that are enjoying the resurrection after that they, they die with Christ. The resurrection of the dead, that's in Matthew's gospel that we're going to talk about as well. That's also a reference to the communion with the saints, and I'll show you why in just a bit. So we're, also, we're enjoying the communication with the church triumphant in heaven, the church militant on earth, and the suffering church in purgatory. We're all collectively the mystical body of Christ entire in that regard. And we are bonded together in a supernatural bond of charity by the merits of Christ. Through Christ's merit and his love and charity, we are united as one body where we pray and intercede for one another. And it is implicitly evident in Scripture that we do that. In Revelations, John's Revelation, and I'll show you that in just a minute as well. So St. John's Revelation is the one, uh, Revelations 5, 5, that one of the elders said to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Okay? So one of the elders said to John, and he's telling us, one of the elders said to me, who are these elders? Well, there's other angels. He's talking about the angels, too, in this, in this, in this Revelation. Revelations 5, there's angels there, too. But who's this elder? Is he an angel? No. Is he God? No. Well, who is he? He's one of the elders that went before us, and he died with Christ, and, he raised, and he's enjoying the resurrection with Christ in eternal glory. He is a saint, enjoying eternal bliss, and he's conversing with John while John is on earth. 
That's the communion with the saints. So it is in Scripture. Maybe it's implied. It's kind of explicit to me, if you ask me. I don't know how you can miss that. But he is talking to an elder other than God, a saint other than God and other than an angel. Although he's also conversing with the angels too, because the angels are saints as well. All right? Now, Now, what the opposition will say, well, you know, those that don't believe in the communion of saints, or I go directly to God, what they'll say is, well, we're not allowed to speak to angels or elders. I go directly to God. Well, wow, okay. All right. I mean, well, let me flip the war in here a little bit. Well, can you imagine if St. John said to the elder or the angels, well, I don't talk to elders or I don't talk to angels because I don't want to commit idolatry. I go directly to God. You imagine if he did that during his revelation. What a tragedy that would be. You can see, you can see that it's unreasonable to say I go directly to God because St. John didn't. Even Mary didn't. Even St. Joseph didn't. He had dreams of angels. So I think it's more reasonable to say that the communion with the saints is in Scripture and is biblical, and I just pointed out one very powerful reference to it. Now let's go to Matthew's Gospel, 22, verses 29 to 33. They will be like the angels of God. All right? Jesus said, after the, the scribes and Pharisees, wherever they were, questioned him, they tried to trap him. You know, whose wife will she be after the resurrection? Of course, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they're trying to trick him. And our Lord says, do you, know, you don't even understand your scripture. You don't even know your scripture, nor do you understand it. He says, after the resurrection, they will be like the angels. And then he goes on to say, because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. You know, um, meaning God doesn't, after they die and they rise with him, he doesn't stuff them in a closet and say, I'm done with you. No, after the resurrection, our charity increases. They all the more want to intercede for us, uh, the church militant, on our journey, our pilgrimage towards the heavenly uh, reality. They want more than nothing for us to join them in heaven, and so do the angels. That's why God sends the angels all throughout the Old Testament history. Even in the New Testament, he sends the angels as ambassadors, as intercessors, those that bring the word of God to us. They're saints, and they're communicating with us on earth. That's the communion with the saints. It's the same thing um, with Our Lady all right, and the other saints. Because God is the God of the living, not of the dead. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac meaning they don't die after they die. They, some, some of the uh, uh, objections is, well, St. Paul says after they fall asleep in, our, in Christ. Well, he's talking about them dying in Christ, but he doesn't put them to sleep for all eternity. So that's unreasonable to think that. Now, the question to ask is if Jesus said they will be like the angels, all of us are going to be like the angels after we die in Christ at the resurrection, the question to ask is, well, what do the angels do? Well, they act as mediators between God and man as they carry out the will of God so we could benefit from his great mercy. The angels want nothing more than our salvation. I guarantee it. The good angels. The bad angels want us in hell. The good angels, they intercede for us on our behalf at the mercy of God and his great goodness. He sends them because he loves us so much to help us. They're also mediators between us and God. I mean, they have to be. The angels are ambassadors. They represent God, bringing his word, words of admonishment, words of instruction, and they guide us. And they protect our salvation. So that's, these are the angels, and that's what they do. And Jesus says, we will be like the angels after the resurrection and from the dead. How much more Mary, who is the queen of the angels, who is the mother of Jesus Christ, our brother, our, our beloved brother. He is the firstborn among many brethren, St. Paul teaches us. If Mary is his mother, Jesus must be our brother. 
if Jesus is our brother, Mary must be our mother. And how could I say, well, I got married, a mother, I go directly to God. That's unreasonable. Can you imagine if Tobit said to the archangel Raphael, I go directly to God. Wow. And better yet, can you imagine if Mary said to the archangel Gabriel, I go directly to God. You know, in fact, why don't you have him come down here and ask me to become the mother of his son? Of course, her humility wouldn't allow that. We want to imitate Mary in her humility and say, how can this be that I do not know man? What, what, what matter of salutation is this? You see? I'm sure Mary was very accustomed to seeing angels because she was that holy. She, was, she possessed the fullness of original innocence, original justice before the fall, the way it was before the fall of Adam and Eve. What was that like? Well, none of us will ever know. She is the only one who will ever know. And as a full creature, not God, Jesus knows. He's God. But the only creature ever created who will ever know what original innocence is par excellence in eternity, for all eternity, is Mary, and no one, ever, no one else ever will. That is hyperdulia. God honored her hyperdulia. Because Mary is the only one. Veneration given to Mary alone. Okay. Let's go to the Annunciation, and we're going to find where Hyperdulia is. And even God is honoring her Hyperdulia through the mouth of St. Gabriel, the great archangel, because he's an ambassador. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, that scripture, it's explicit. It's coming from the mouth of a great angel sent by God. The angel has to be full of God, the Holy Spirit. And if it weren't pleasing, these words coming out of the mouth of Gabriel, then why did not the Holy Spirit retract from Gabriel? You see? That would be unreasonable to think so. Who having heard, Mary heard, was troubled at saying and thought within herself, what manner of salutation should this be? Now, I remember Father Brian the Lady a while back, I don't know if it was on EWTN, but he was talking about this very scripture verse, how the angel actually, according to the church fathers, the angel bowed to Mary as he said, Hail, full of grace, blessed are you among women. He says, nowhere else in scripture can you find an angel bowing to anybody. So the angel, in that sense, is honoring Mary hyperdulia. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God, for thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt name him Jesus. Anybody knows that Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the divine trinity. That is a huge honor to Mary to even become the mother of a God. You can't get any loftier than that. So God is honoring her hyperdulia. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High. God shall give him the throne of his father David. He shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Those are words pointing to a great king, a divine king, a majestic king beyond imagining, an infinitely majestic divine king. And Mary's his mother. Those are pretty high, honorable words, not only given to Jesus, rightly so, because God is honoring his son, but he's also honoring Mary with the privilege of becoming his mother. That is a huge honor, and that's right there implicitly in Scripture. So the mother of God, Theotokos, you shall bear a son. And Mary replied, how shall this be? Since I do not know man, that is implying her perpetual virginity because Mary was so holy that she wanted to give her total self to God as a total emptying of herself, including her virginity, belonging totally to God. And when the angel says, you're going to bear a son, she's like, well, how can this be? Because I intend to take a vow of perpetual virginity. 
And the angel explained to her. And she didn't hesitate and say, well, gee, you know, I really would like to take this vow of perpetual virginity. She didn't do that. She said, fiat, be it done unto me according to your word. Yes, be it done unto me because Mary submits perfectly with total and complete self-emptying docility to the very will of God. Now Mary says, let it be done unto me to your word, a Gabriel. Is Gabriel God? I mean, why did not Mary go directly to God? She knows that God is in that angel. She knows that it is coming directly from God through his instrument, the angel. God sends his ambassadors. He sends his saints and angels. They will be like the angels after the resurrection. He will send them. And he continues to send them today, especially his great mother, who loves us more than we can imagine. So Mary did the great the will of God perfectly, and this is where she merited most hyperdulia. And the only way that she could will do the will of God perfectly is if she was conceived in the state of original innocence. Otherwise, Scripture tells us that the serpent cast doubt on the heart of Adam and Eve. He cast doubt on the words of God and doubt on God's great goodness and mercy, and Adam and Eve bought it, and therefore they turned their backs. If Mary was conceived in original sin then more than likely she would have turned her back on God at the moment she was to conceive because she would have doubted his great goodness. All of us doubt because St. Paul teaches that all of us fall short of the glory of God. Not one is righteous. No, not one. But Jesus preserved at least one. And you may ask, well, well, why would he do that? Well, because he's God. He He did it. And only one immaculate conception is necessary. The rest of us have to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. But one, if God, Jesus, can preserve one according to his original plan of an original innocence, that is his masterpiece through which he's going to build the rest of our salvation upon. Because Mary is going to make up all that Adam and Eve has lost. Jesus, of course, makes up for all that Adam lost. Mary makes up and heals the wound that Eden, Eve kept, has committed. All right, so words from St. John Paul II from the Theology of the Body about casting doubt. He said in the garden, and be Adam and Eve, the serpent, by casting doubt in the heart of the man, Adam, on the deep meaning of the gift of self, meaning his total self-emptying gift to God, because that's Trinitarian. God is, is, gives, is a self-donate. He totally gives a self-donation. He holds nothing back. He's total gift for the other. The divine trinity, love between the trinity, is the Father gives himself totally and unreservedly to the Son, and the Son does the same to the Father, and the Holy Spirit does the same to the Father and the Son. A total self-emptying, without holding anything back, without any impurity, ill intentions, or doubt. Well, Mary had to have the same Trinitarian love of being totally self-emptying, a total self-gift without holding anything back to receive the greatest gift that God could ever bestow on a creature and on all of humanity, his only son, the Savior of the world. If she were not, if she had any impure, the slightest stain of sin, it would never have taken place meaning the, the incarnation would never have taken place. So she's immaculately conceived by grace of anticipation, you say. Because Jesus merited that, he saw from all eternity, because God lives in the eternal present, the eternal now. He can do whatever he wants, he's God. So he saw from all eternity, he anticipated that grace where Mary was conceived immaculate in the womb of of uh, her mother, St. Anne, where other, uh, other souls, all of us, rest of God's children, Mary's children, we become full of grace like Mary by anteceding grace. So Mary was re- redeemed. That's why she's got, she said, God's my Savior. Mary was redeemed by grace of anticipation, immaculately conceived. We are redeemed by anteceding grace. And like St. Paul says, 
It's no longer I. Christ lives in me. He has become full of grace at that point, in that sense. I'm full of Christ. No longer I. Christ lives totally in me. I'm dead totally to myself. Mary's full of grace. At the visitation when she went to her mother Elizabeth, Mary was full of grace in her womb, in her whole being. Okay? So God honors Mary and shows us how to honor Mary in the visitation. All right? The first words that comes out of the mouth of Elizabeth, most blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, let's step back a minute. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit at that point and she cries out in a loud voice. The moment your voice, Mary, sounded in my ears. So she's pointing to the instrument that the Holy Spirit used, Mary, especially her voice, to bestow this dulia, if you will, an honor given to a creature, Elizabeth, who is filled with the Holy Spirit at Mary's visitation, at the babe in Mary's womb. But the Holy Spirit is using the voice of Mary to convey that grace. And Elizabeth is, lo and behold, filled with the Holy Spirit, crying out, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And if it were not pleasing to God for Elizabeth to cry those words out, then why did the Holy Spirit not retract from her? So, let's take a step, another step back. Out of the mouth of Mary, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, she her the babe in her womb still stirs and he is sanctified. John the Baptist is sanctified at the presence of Mary and the presence of Jesus in her womb. He's sanctified. He's baptized in the womb of Mary of Elizabeth at the sound of Mary's voice. That's pretty powerful. All right, and then God honors Mary through the mouth of Elizabeth. Now, how do we know that? It's not explicitly said, well, God is now honoring Mary through mouth of Elizabeth. It doesn't say that explicitly. It says it implicitly. She's filled with the Holy Spirit and cries out, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. It can't get any clearer than that. And I can't understand how anybody can miss that. I can't understand, especially if we love Scripture and we read it all. How could we miss that? So most blessed are you among women. And then Mary, uh, Elizabeth again, is prophesying, all right? She prophesies because she's filled with the Holy Spirit. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, how did Mary know that Mary, uh, I mean, Elizabeth know that Mary was the mother of her Lord? I mean, did Mary call her from a cell phone before she came? Oh, by the way, cousin Elizabeth, um, I'm pregnant with the Savior of the world, the mother of your God. I'm coming to visit you. I don't think so. At the moment, sound of Mary's voice, she was filled with the Holy Spirit. The babe left in her, jo in her womb, cries out, blessed are you among women, blessed the fruit of your womb. And she prophesies. She knows that she's the mother of our Lord. Of our Lord. And she recognizes the great dignity of who it is speaking to her and the great dignity of who it is in her womb and the great dignity of the Holy Spirit that's pouring, emanating from her being. My being proclaims the greatness of the Lord. This screams honor Mary. Scripture is screaming honor Mary. But we don't see it explicitly in Scripture because of Mary's humility. Remember in the beginning, she requested it of her son to keep it hidden. All right, But he didn't keep it completely hidden because he really wants us to know the truth about Mary. And he's given it to her right here, clear as day, in Luke's gospel. All right, so out of the mouth of Elizabeth, God is honoring Mary hyperdulia. All right? And, again, how does this happen to the mother of my Lord should come to me? We should all have that attitude toward the mother of God. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Yet, many of us ignore her or don't think she's that important. Elizabeth thinks she's really important. 
being filled with the Holy Spirit, she recognizes the great dignity that the Queen of Heaven, with the King of Heaven in her womb, is. It screams hyperdulia. Scripture is screaming. So God is honoring Mary, but he's also showing us how to honor Mary in Scripture. And then Elizabeth goes on to say, while being filled with the Holy Spirit, remember, blessed are you who have believed that was spoken to you by the word, by the Lord would be fulfilled. So she, the God is honoring Mary hyperdulia through the voice of Elizabeth as she's filled with the Holy Spirit, saying, blessed are you because you fulfilled perfectly the will of God, Mary. Now Jesus gives us a reference, and not an explicit one, but a reference in Scripture, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, 27, verse 27, he says, and this is where the woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that you sucked. And he said, Jesus said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Notice Jesus didn't give Mary, she, he's honoring her request and to be hidden, and he hid her. He didn't, he, didn't re, he didn't reveal it. But he did not uh, hide the fact that she is so blessed because she's, do, she's doing the will of God. She, he is honoring her in an indirect way. Blessed are those, rather, who hear the word of God and keep it. And if there's any creature that you know of that has kept the word of God more than Mary, then I would say again, that person should step aside prostrate himself before the infinite majesty of God, and God will exalt him above Mary. Listen to what St. Maximilian Colby says on that, Mary doing uh, God's perfect will. Uh, Mary's perfect cooperation in God's holy will. St. Max says, quote, Among all creatures in the universe, the Immaculata deserves special mention. The creature most completely filled with his love filled with God himself, was the Immaculata who never contracted the slightest stain of sin. That's the Immaculate Conception. He goes on. Who never departed in the least from God's will. Remember, St. Paul says, all fall short of the glory of God, meaning that we all have departed from the will of God in one way or another, to some degree or another, but not Mary. That's another I implicit reference to the Immaculate Conception, because the only way you can do God's will perfectly is if you were without the state of sin to hinder that. She had to be perfectly immaculate and pure to keep God's holy will. Otherwise, she would have turned her back like the rest of us on God in some degree or other. So, united to the Holy Spirit as his spouse, she is the one with God in an incomparably more perfect way than can be predicated to any other creature. Those are pretty strong words from a very great saint who was very devoted to the Immaculata, the Immaculate Conception, who was martyred for the faith in the Nazi Germany concentration camps. All right, quotes from great saints expressing gratitude toward their love of Mary. Now, this is St. Louis de Montfort. I quote him, Many saints have avowed to speak most admirably of Mary, the holy city of God, and always spoke about her most eloquently, knowing what God has revealed to them about her. They said things like this, The merits of Mary are so immeasurably high above all the other saints and ascend to the throne of the divinity, so much so they cannot be seen. Why? Because she's so high above us. It's, there's, there's like an, a vast ocean of void between us and all the other saints and angels, between Mary and us. That's how highly exalted a daughter she is. Why? It's directly proportional to her humility. Her charity so excels that of all the angels and saints combined that it is impossible to measure for this reason. The length of her power which she exercises over God himself is incomprehensible. The depths of her humility and graces is an abyss which never can be sounded. Words from one of the greatest Marian saints ever, St. Louis de Montfort. St. Bonaventure, 
He says, quote, The angels in heaven cry out incessantly to her, Holy, 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 Mary, Mother of God and Virgin. The angels are giving Mary hyperdulia. Holy, 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 Mary, Mother of God and Virgin. That's St. Bonaventure. And then he goes on to say, and that they offer millions upon millions of times a day the angelic salutation. What is that? Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Hail, full of grace. That's the angelic salutation. Hail, full of grace. And Elizabeth goes on further. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So they, and so they say, Ave Maria, and the angels prostrating themselves before her and begging her of her graciousness to humor them with some of her commands. That's St. Bonaventure. These aren't my words. But the only way that you could speak words as this, from a, especially a great saint like that, is because you would have to come to know the creature Mary to that degree. Sublimely happy are those whom the Holy Spirit imparts the true knowledge of Mary. That's what St. Louis of Mavra says. The greatest saint Augustine. Let's go to him. Let's see what he says about Mary. He says, quote, even St. Michael, although the prince of the heavenly host, is the most zealous of honoring her and causing her to be honored, is always anxiously awaiting the honor of going at her bidding to render service to some one of her servants. To render service, again, the angels, they will be like the angels. Here's St. Michael the archangel wanting to render service to one of Mary's children who are the brothers of Christ, the rest of her children. And sisters, again, an ambassador, an intercessor. This is the communion with the saints. And that's St. Augustine. All right, now, if this seems a bit over the top for some, I understand. It seems like we're giving way too much honor. It's almost like worshiping Mary. And if we were worshiping Mary, you know what? I would come join you and say, you know what? You're right. Honor belongs and worship belongs to God alone. Well, worship belongs to God alone. But there's a thing called dulia, latria, and hyperdulia, which is veneration, the highest honor, the highest reverence. It's not worship. It's reverence and honor. All right? And even St. Louis de Montfort says this, to clarify anyone who would think, well, Catholics worship Mary. No. This is what St. Louis de Montfort said, one of the greatest Catholics of the church that, it, that one of the greatest Catholic saints of our time of, of the time of our times and a greatest Marian saint he says and he loves Mary trust me he says this I of all with all the church meaning the Catholic Church that Mary being a mere creature that has come from the highest is in comparison of his infinite majesty less than an atom that's coming from the mouth and the writings of St. Louis de Montfort, who was one of the greatest saints that gave Mary hyperdulia. You go read his writings. He is admitting that she, in comparison to the infinite majesty of God, is less than an atom. And then he says, rather, she is nothing at all. How about that? So, so much for the argument Catholics at worship Mary. No, they don't. She is nothing at all. Because only he is who is. And I agree with him 100%. And I think all of those listening would agree with him 100% too. She's a creature. She is not God. On the benefits of Marian devotion, praying to Mary. There is no quicker, easier, surer way to sanctification than through Mary. All right? So that is St. Maximilian Colby drawing from St. Louis de Montfort who said that, and great saints like St. Saint Pope Leo XIII said something similar, and St. Pius X actually has in his encyclical Ad Deum Ilium, there is no, this is what he says, quote in his encyclical, there is no sure or easier way than Mary in uniting all men with Christ. That's a great pope, St. Pius X. All right? So, so much for Mary that casting a shadow on the glory of God alone. It doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable to think so. In fact, St. Maximilian Colby says Mary does not rob God of glory, but magnifies him. He, she magnifies his glory. 
my soul doth magnify the Lord. Or my, my soul glorifies the Lord. That's her magnificat taken out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 46. Again, it implicitly uh, um, evident. So this is what St. Maximilian Colby says on that note. Quote, Colby recognized that the greatest way to give glory to God is to unite oneself to the creature who glorifies God most perfectly. Makes sense. Because she makes up what we're lacking. All of us fall short of the glory of God, but not Mary. Not the mother that bore the Son of God. I got news for you. And St. Maximilian Colby agrees with that. Mary Immaculate. She glorifies God most perfectly. He, St. Maximilian Colby also realized that the way to give God the greatest glory is not to do so by just one person, but to have a whole army, a militia of people who give God the greatest glory. In fact, he wanted this army of the Immaculata, called the Militia Immaculata, to eventually get the whole world to give God the greatest glory through Mary as soon as possible. Colby goes on to say that through the Immaculata, we will attain the ultimate purpose of the the Militia Immaculata, that is, the greatest possible glory to God. So St. Maximilian Colby was one of those souls that, that in his humility, the Holy Spirit imparted the true knowledge of Mary to him. Happy indeed, sublimely happy are those whom the Holy Spirit imparts the true knowledge of Mary. Jesus really wants to impart part that. Remember, it was his mother in her humility, and he can't refuse her anything. She requested that he keep her hidden in this way. But Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, he cannot keep her hidden totally, and he found another way to reveal the truth about Mary. Of course, through St. Maximilian Colby, through St. Louis de Montfort, through St. Augustine, through St. Bonaventure, Pius X, St. Anthony Mary Claret, uh, St. John Eudes, St. Teresa of Calcutta, St. Pio, St. Bonaventure, all of these great saints, God is using their mouths as instruments to proclaim the glories of Mary. St. Alphonsus Liguori, he wrote a book on the glories of Mary. And he's actually using um, a, a wretched creature like me. God can actually use a, a bumbling who, one who falls very short of the glory of God to proclaim Mary's glories. So he found another way. So there you have it. That is the Immaculate Conception, and I'll just uh, I'll just uh, summarize a little bit. In order for the incarnation to take place, Mary had to possess or be in the state of original innocence and possess the fullness of original innocence be, with no stain of sin because original innocence, the serpent cast doubt into the hearts of Adam and Eve. And in their doubt, they turned their backs on God. That is the hideousness and the mystery of iniquity. We separate ourselves from the will of God. Mary had to do the will of God perfectly in order in order for the incarnation to take place, because we were talking about the, uh, conceiving the God-man. It's not a small thing. It's, not, it's something that God could not be conceived in a womb that has been conceived in original sin. It's, that's reasonable. To say otherwise is unreasonable. Jesus would have contracted original sin, too. So it's not explicitly there, the Immaculate Conception, but it is implied because there's no other way the Incarnation would have taken place because Mary's perfect yes, that fiat, would not have been perfect anymore. You see? So that is the Immaculate Conception. It is made dogma by, by the Church to make it etched in stone. Every Catholic Christian should believe it and accept it whether they like it or not. It is dogma. It is 100% certain that the Immaculate Conception of Mary took, has taken place, and in honor of her Immaculate Conception, her feast day today, December the 8th, I, I salute you, Mary, like the Archangel Gabriel. Hats off to you, O good and tender mother. I cannot thank God enough for you. I cannot thank you enough for your, your gentle, tender love for us poor, miserable creatures 
who loves your son so much that you want nothing more for their salvation, and you will die a thousand deaths with your son all over if God the Father would permit it, just to save one of your children. That's for certain. So I'll end on that note, and I thank you all for joining me. I hope this has inspired you. Please pray for me, and I will be praying for you. I promise you, may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all abundantly, your families, and may the Immaculate Heart of Mary intercede for you in the most powerful way so that she can bring you to perfect union with the sacred heart of her son, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.